How many people are in the room? That was the first thing Stella asked me as she settled in at the table. I looked around the diner. It was two in the morning. The place was mostly empty. What do you mean? How many people are in here right now? Besides us, she said. Maybe five, six, I replied. Stella's lips trembled. How many people are in the room exactly? She was terrified. I counted. The waiter, the old man staring into a bowl of soup by the door. The two young women coming down from a night of partying over pancakes. The guy in a bowl cap, trying to cut through his overcooked steak. And the middle-aged woman in a pea-green overcoat. Six, I said. Six people. Stella instantly relaxed. Thank you. Stella and I hadn't seen each other in five months. I was in school out of state and was home for the summer. Stella had gotten into a good university, but her sister Anne had died in a car wreck two weeks before she went off to school. The death hit her hard, real hard. I wasn't sure why she'd called me. I doubted it was to catch up, and it certainly wasn't to party. Stella knew I abstained from everything. For me, that decision was the end result of being raised by verbally abusive alcoholics and knowing the genetic odds. Stella looked rough. Not strung out, but existentially exhausted. There were scars on her hands, bruises mottling her tattooed forearms, and some unusual scarification marks on her neck. Two of them, they looked like clumsy Zs, but reversed as if done in a mirror. Stella's friend Corey had dropped her off at the diner about 30 minutes before I'd gotten there. I didn't know him well, but what I did know, I didn't like. So, how are you holding up? I asked. Stella didn't answer. The waiter appeared and Stella looked him over, cautiously, before she ordered a black coffee and a slice of blueberry pie. I got a hot tea and a side of fries, though I wasn't exactly hungry. We sat in uncomfortable silence for a few minutes before Stella, staring down at her hands, asked, What's the worst thing you ever did? I shrugged, said, Lied to people, lied to get out of things, mostly to my friends in high school, but I've changed. I don't do that anymore. Oh, I also shoplifted once, a pair of socks. Stella laughed. That's when the waiter reappeared, with our drinks and food. Stella jumped, her eyes wide, face flushed. The other people in the diner turned and looked but did nothing. You all right? The waiter asked, weirded out. Taking a deep breath, Stella slowly sat back down. Yeah, sorry, she said. I just... Just it's been a long night. The waiter shook his head as he put the stuff down. When he left, Stella sipped her coffee. And then she looked over the mug at me, her eyes tearing. I did the worst thing you can do. I tried to kill someone. I wasn't sure I heard her correctly. What? Stella nodded, eyes locked on mine. A jogger. Corey and me hit him with the car. Oh my god. When did this... On my way here. The blood drained from my face. We should call the cops. He could still be there, hurt and... Uh... Don't bother. She interrupted. We went back and checked on him. There was no jogger. What's that fucking mean? I was starting to lose it. Please don't start playing games with me. I said. I don't want to hear this sort of bullshit. Isn't bullshit, Stella replied. Ask Corey. I didn't want to call Corey. Stella said. I didn't actually see the jogger. 
Corey did. That's how I knew. So I asked him exactly where the man was and I grabbed the wheel and Corey screamed at me as I made the car slam into the guy. Sent him flying, like it mattered. Corey hit the brakes hard. He was losing it, talking about going to prison and his life being over. But I told him not to worry. That pissed him off something bad. When he got out of the car to go help the jogger, he just froze up because there was no one there. Road was empty. Me, I expected that. She took another sip of coffee and poked at the slice of pie with her fork. Stabbing the crust and examining the blue tinged tines in the dull fluorescent light. See, it can look just like a person. Could be any age, dressed any sort of way. It talks like a person, eats, drinks, does all the regular sorts of things people do. Doesn't exactly sound threatening, I know. But wait for the twist, I can't see it. This thing pretending to be a person, it's invisible to me. But you, you and everyone else, you can see it. I don't know what you're talking about. And I didn't. Stella finally looked up at me. Two weeks ago we were tripping, me and Corey, and this woman named Genevieve. She was the guide. This was at Corey's house, on the deck. We dropped N-bomb, that synthetic MDMA stuff. We'd been using hallucinogens and trying to explore an inner mental space. Tripping together, sharing the same imagery. It's crazy how, if you're in sync, like emotionally and mentally, you can basically travel together. I know how it sounds, I do, but it was really working for us. We were, I guess you'd describe it something like astral traveling. We built this architecture, this city, in our minds, and then explored it. Mostly, it was made of shifting, beautiful buildings structures that rose over us like mountain ranges and uh, in this mental city that's where we came across it the diner door chimed as the two young women having pancakes left Stella watched them go then turned back to me I didn't need an explanation there are four people in here now I said she nodded sipped more coffee, and then continued. Well, this night, we traveled deeper into the city than we'd ever been before. We ended up in a tower, had a spiral staircase. We all went up to the top floor and found a locked door. You're all seeing the same thing? I interrupted, not buying the experience. Yes, Stella's demeanor had intensified. The twitchiness melted away. We all saw it. Okay. So we get to this door. It's a metal door. Dented but from the inside. Bulging out. Like someone was kicking the door. Trying to smash it down. Genevieve, she got scared. Told us to not open that door. To stay far away from it. She said a voyager was on the other side. Voyager? That's what Genevieve called it. Being a guide, she knew the sort of constructions we were exploring. She'd seen doors like this one. And she'd been warned about the voyagers. The way she told it, they were like us. Explorers in inner space, but not from our reality. From another one. A bad one. But long story short, I opened the door. Why would you do that? Stella stirred her coffee lost in thought for a second. As she did, one of the cooks quietly came out from the kitchen and sat at the counter. He flicked through a newspaper someone had left and glanced over at me. He nodded, gave a little smile. I wondered if he'd made the fries I wasn't eating. After Corey and Genevieve drifted away, Stella continued still staring at her drink. I heard a voice on the other side of the door, my sister's voice. She was begging, 
pleading with me to let her out. I swear it was her. So, I opened that metal door. Feeling the stare of the cook, I ate a few of the fries. They were cold, soggy. What happened? I asked Stella. When I opened it, something suddenly brushed past me. Something clammy, cold. It touched me, very briefly. There was pain. Stella unconsciously motioned to the Z scars on her neck, then continued. Anyway, there wasn't a room on the other side of the door. Just a void, a deep emptiness. When the trip was over, I immediately felt a change. I felt like I was being watched. The whole rest of that night, the next day, the next week, something was following me, a shadow, a presence. And I knew, I just deep in my gut knew, that if it caught up with me, if it touched me again, I would die. She kept stabbing at her slice of pie, breaking the crust, letting the congealed blueberries slowly tumble out in a little landslide of jelly. You told me that you can't see this thing, Stella. The door to the diner opened, and two men in work overalls walked in, each holding a hard hat, their clothes dusty. Stella suddenly straightened in her chair. Two men just walked into the diner, right? I nodded. Yeah, just those two guys. Stella settled. Why me? I asked. Why did you want to meet? To tell me this? Stella smiled. First time she'd done that all night. Because I knew you'd believe me. I swallowed hard, my throat suddenly, impossibly dry. You've been a good friend. Stella blinked away, welling emotion. In high school, when things got bad, with... with boyfriends or assholes, you were the one I could confide in. The one that trusted me. The one that, no matter what I did, no matter how stupid it was, you were there for me. A shoulder to cry on. A hand to hold. And she reached across the table and took my hand. Squeezed it tight. Truth was, I'd had a crush on Stella most of high school. She was a friend, for sure, and for a while, a good friend. I liked being that rock for her, but I'd always hoped for more. Like most friendships, it began with a one-sided attraction, mine. And even though I hadn't seen her in half a year, those feelings remained. Dormant but there, waiting to be awakened. As Stella held my hand and smiled, I noticed, I felt, her fingernail tracing something on the inside of my palm. At first slight, just a little pressure. Only, it got sharper until, ouch, shit. I pulled my hand away to find Stella had cut me. She'd sliced the shape with her sharp pinky nail into my skin. It was a backward letter Z, like the ones on her neck. A ribbon of blood began to well up from the center of the small cut. What the hell, Stella? She just shook her head and stood up, backing away from the table, repeating over and over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to, okay? I had to. Had to what? Hurt me? I was furious. Confused. Everyone in the diner turned to watch us. Only the cook got up from his place at the counter and walked over, eager to lend a hand. I waved him away. It's okay. I got it under control. That was when Stella broke, her voice barely a whisper. What? I told him I got it. She went pale. Who? Who'd you tell? The cook, I yelled. He's just trying to help you. There is no cook. No one's there. Stella began shrieking, scrambling backward. She slammed into a nearby table. Chairs fell over. Silverware scattered. No, no, she yelled. No one's there. 
the cook kneeled down beside Stella, and for a split second, bewildered as I was, I honestly thought he was going to help her up. He didn't. Instead, he leaned in close to her. She was crying and shaking, and clearly couldn't see him. The cook turned to me, nodded with a sick grin, and then opened his mouth wide to reveal jumbled, bloody gums filled with jagged teeth. He tore her throat out with a single bite, and as Stella's blood pumped out across the linoleum flooring, the cook vanished. Not a slow fade, not dissolving into mist. Just there one second and gone the next. Someone screamed. I think it was the woman in the pea green overcoat. Afterward, when the cops came, a story emerged. All the other people in the diner that night, they said Stella cut her own throat with a knife. Where she got the knife from, and where it went, they didn't know. They also said that the cook had tried to help her, that he attempted to close the wound and save her life. The cops couldn't find him after the EMTs got there. When I went back to the diner the next day to ask about what happened, the waiter claimed they didn't even have a cook, who resembled the man I described, the man I saw. It was as if, after Stella's death, all the details of her demise began to unravel, like the universe was erasing her from existence entirely. And now, the Voyager, whatever it is, has come for me. It's been five days since Stella died in that diner. Five days I've been haunted and hunted. I tracked down Corey and he led me to Genevieve. She told me what fate awaited me. According to her, Voyagers used the symbol, the backward Z's that were on Stella's neck, the one she scratched into my flesh to track their victims down. Stella, I guess she thought she could trick the Voyager into taking me. Instead of her, it didn't work, and now she's doomed me. It's just a matter of time before there's an extra person, a person I can't see, sitting across from me on a bus or walking behind me on the street. Right now, I'm in my bedroom at my parents' house. I haven't left in 48 hours and they're getting worried about me. They'd heard I lost a friend, though they can't seem to recall anyone named Stella going to high school with me. And so they're being compassionate and letting me stay cooped up. But they've told me I've had visitors, folks stopping by unannounced. Folks who, when I crane my neck out my window to catch a glimpse of them standing on the porch, aren't there at all. Just my parents talking, gesturing, into empty space. I'm going to have to leave this room eventually. That or my parents will get worried enough that they'll have me helped out, likely to the hospital. And when I get there, I'll be asking the same question Stella did. How many people are in here right now? How many exactly? It's 2 a.m. Cassie's mournful dirge drifts up from the pantry. I lie in bed staring at the moonlight through the open window, exhausted from the absence of sleep, pondering whether tonight is the night I start to set boundaries, feign ignorance to my daughter's call for attention, or go downstairs to take care of her needs, as I have done every night since she died. The illuminated hands of the clock read 2.30 a.m by the time she falls silent. For a moment, hope offers me its hand. Has the torment finally ended? Is peace now mine? A drumbeat pounds in my ears. Nerves fire of insur intention in 2.45 a.m. Is the time I begin to believe she has quitted for the night. I close my eyes. Britta in, Britta out. Unfamiliar calm trickles in. At the point sleep beckons. A sudden thunder crash of rage shakes my bed, 
and I hear Cassie howl like a banshee. Hope withdrawn, I throw off the duvet, slide my feet into cold slippers, and head downstairs on a silent prayer for Cassie to be gone by the time I open the pantry door. But she's there, on top of the refrigerator, like a mound of meringue, all folds and as white as freshly fallen snow. The silver heart charm that dangled from her wrist in life still in place. Her shadowy eyes are red and swollen. Her pudgy hands reach out to grasp the air. About time, she wails. I repeat of what she says to me every night. I sigh, rub my sore eyes. Sorry, sweetie, I was trying to sleep. It's almost 3 a.m. You do realize that? A flash of time's passed, when Cassie, a toddler, would creep into my room in the early hours to tell me she had been calling out for help in the bathroom. And would I come with her right now? Because she really needed to go, me chastising her, as I chastise her now. I shrug. Then again, you're a spirit. So maybe you don't. A moan bubbles, bursts up from her insides. The pitch is ear-splitting. I'm forced to cover my ears. Do you realize how long I've been waiting? She says. Are you trying to starve me all over again? She drags out the word starve. It stokes my guilt. And in my exhaustion, I want to laugh hysterically. I open the fridge door, bury the sarcastic smile playing on my lips amidst the piles of food on the shelves. Cream-filled pastries, trifles, cooked sausages and bacon, chocolate muffins topped with swirly icing domes. A foodie's paradise, but the sight makes me balk. Food dominated Cassie's 19-year lifespan, mine too. I cannot believe it dominates her in death. What would you like, Cassie? There's lots to choose from. How about... Uh, before I can finish, her yelling bounces off the pantry walls. Anything. Just give me anything. I need to feed. And you're frittering away. Precious time asking me what I'd like. I take out the plate of sausages. In those first few weeks she showed up. I took the time to place them in a bread roll. Slather on ketchup and mustard to make it look appealing. I don't bother with the presentation now. Instead, I throw them into her open mouth as if I'm feeding a ravenous feral dog. She doesn't chew. I'm not sure ghosts have the ability, but gulps them down in an instant. I see them slip through her transparent, organ-free form. It's like watching a medical scan in real time. They leave her as they went in, whole, unchewed, undigested, splatting to the floor. I follow with the cakes and trifles, watch my spirit daughter gorge, only to cry for more. I take the dustpan and brush, sweep up the mess, pour it back into her. And this is the cycle, pending her being satiated enough to cease her demands. Once the cycle stops and Cassie is soothed, I'll clean up, throw it all in the bin. It'll be far too mushy by then to save. Besides, it soon stinks the place out. Then I'll sit a while, talk to her about anything, and nothing, until those shadowy eyes of hers close, and she falls silent for the rest of the night. I share some blame for Cassie's current state, and for how her life turned out. Weighing in at a hefty 13 pounds, after a pregnancy sustained purely by chocolate bars, the only food my constantly nauseous stomach wouldn't eject. Cassie suckled the entire first night. Such was her voracious demands, until I was too sore for her to touch me. A bout of mastitis sealed the deal to move her onto bottle feeds. We'll see if she's meant to be this big, the health visitor said. You're only a small build, so maybe she'll slow down. Cassie did slow down, but I wasn't worried. Children grow at different paces. 
she possessed a healthy appetite, cleaning every morsel from her plate and more. An active child, she remained slim, but followed her centiles, a term used by health professionals. Listening to the mothers at the school gates, fraught with their fussy eaters, I admit to feeling smug. Then one day, karma bit me for my arrogance. Cassie stopped eating. Her personality changed. She was having trouble with her friends. Bullying, her teachers said. A phase, I thought. But after six months it dawned that this was no phase. Something far more serious was at play. Cassie is ten years old and weighs what a child. Half her age should weigh. How long has she been experiencing problems with food? The doctor gazed at me with sympathetic eyes as he spoke. I was grateful for it. It made a change from the critical glances I had become used to. I took Cassie's hand, gave it a reassuring squeeze. She pulled away. A fierce scowl that said, you are a lying bitch, came my way. She had gone through the surgery door under false pretense, that of holiday vaccines to go somewhere exotic. I had said it with my face set in stone so she didn't suspect. I risked paying a heavy price for inventing such a whopper, but by then I'd have done and said anything if it meant getting Cassie help. Since summer, so six or seven months maybe, I replied. She didn't like the way she looked in her swimsuit, said her thighs were too wobbly to be on show. I thought it would pass, only it hasn't. It's getting worse. I've been called to collect her from school several times because she's fainted. She gets breathless at the slightest exertion. Her bones jut out. She's pale and sleeps a lot. I'm really worried about her. I wanted to say I feared she'd die, but to say it could make it happen, so I kept it to myself. There's a risk of lifelong health problems if she doesn't start gaining weight. The doctor looked to Cassie. Do you understand what is happening here, Cassie? You are very thin, and it's not good for you. Cassie stared at the floor, her arms crossed over her chest. The doctor sighed. Let's see what help we can get for you, shall we? We left the surgery, a prescription for supplementary feeds, iron pills and vitamins stuffed in my pocket. A referral to child psychiatry on its way. Cassie sulked all the way home, shut herself away for several days without uttering a word to me. When she did finally show, her rage had stepped up a notch. How dare you tell the doctor that I don't eat, mom, she yelled. It is my business, not yours and not his. She stood in the middle of the kitchen, arms flailing. Her tiny ribs, visible beneath one of the close-fitting tops she insisted on wearing to display what she saw as a model figure. Cassie's glare cut me. I felt like the devil reincarnated. You need help, sweetie. I've tried to do this on my own, but I'm lost now. I don't know what to do anymore. You're wasting away. I can't stand to see you like this. Then don't look at me. Hands on hips, head thrust forward, a wild glint in her eyes. Cassie, please don't. I only want to help. So shut up and leave me alone. She stomped off to her room. At the top of the stairs, she called out. And just so you know, I will not see a doctor ever again. The door at the bottom of the stairs opened. As Cassie paced towards the kitchen, I was quick to hide the bottle labeled sugar-free lemonade. I had refilled with a sugar-loaded version inside the refrigerator. Cassie was 15 at the time, skeletal, walking miles every day and night. She appeared in the kitchen door, layered up in clothing, a scarf and woolly hat despite the heating being cranked so high I could barely breathe. It's cold outside. They've forecast rain too, I said. Why don't we watch a film? 
I've bought some of that toffee popcorn and hazelnut chocolate you've always liked. Grey rings circled her eyes. Angry red spots shone from her cheeks. Maybe later, she said, and turned to leave. Be back by one. It's clinic today. Don't forget. The front door slammed behind her. Despite her lack of response, I knew Cassie would return home in time for her weekly appointment. She had signed an agreement with the medics, one I knew she would not default on. In exchange for doctors, pausing her forced admission to hospital, she would eat a little more, show up at the clinic every Friday to be weighed, have her bloods checked. We drove to the clinic that afternoon, Cassie staring out of her side window, me humming along to the radio. The sun had broken through the clouds, turning a grey day beautiful. Inside the clinic, Cassie disappeared with the nurse, only to return several moments later, an ecstatic grin on the nurse's face. She's put on a whole kilogram since last week, the nurse announced. A glimmer of light shone. I began to see faith in that pivotal moment, yet my faith would soon be shattered. The next morning, as laundry tossed in the washing machine, I heard a knock-knock coming from inside. I found nothing obvious when I emptied the machine, but when checking through the clothing, I felt small, hard lumps in the hems of Cassie's trousers in the lining of the jacket she had worn the day previous, childlike stitching on the inner side. I picked it open, pebbles fell on the floor. You should have put her in the psychiatric hospital when you had the chance. They'd have sorted her out. They're the professionals, not you. Having chided me throughout this challenging time, my mother's unwanted advice didn't come as a surprise. Cassie doesn't want to be in hospital, mom. And I couldn't bear to think of her being force-fed. And that's what would happen. It would be purgatory for her. I'm sure she'd do something drastic. So she dies either way. Choking back tears, my feet barely touched the floor as I left the house. Car keys in hand. I sped off down the road not knowing where I was headed. I didn't return home for another three months. I woke from the induced coma, three weeks after the car accident. Extensive surgical repairs to my left leg, from thigh to ankle, meant weeks of rehab and learning to walk again. By the time I returned home, Cassie had a slight prominence to her tummy, a rounder face, but she seemed downbeat, soulless. There, you see, my mother proudly paraded a plumper Cassie before me. This is what happens when you set boundaries for your children and don't allow them to control you. I took Cassie's hands. You look amazing, sweetie. So pretty. We hugged. I felt the meat on her bones, the warmth of her. She forced a smile, although darkness sat in her eyes. For the remainder of my mother's stay, I watched Cassie shovel her grandmother's meals into her mouth, mindless, not seeming to taste or enjoy what was going in. She tried to throw it all back up again, when I first arrived, didn't you dear? But I put a stop to that too, my mother announced. Cassie nodded. She didn't look up, said nothing, kept on like a robot, loading her fork, filling her mouth, swallowing. I should have been happy she was eating. I wasn't. When I asked, neither Cassie nor my mother would elaborate on what went on between them during my absence. Cassie would shrug, remain tight-lipped. My mother would smile and say, Proper parenting, dear. Only at Cassie's wake, four years later, did my mother offer her pious explanation. I broke her. That's what happened. I removed everything she liked. Her music, the TV, those awful childish coloring books, 
you insisted on buying for her. I locked her inside the house so she couldn't exercise. I put a spoon to her mouth every damn meal until she caved and started to eat. No food, no reward. When she fought against me, I slapped her. Every minute of every day for the entire three months, never out of my sight. That's all it took to get Cassie back again. It's what you should have done, but no. You had to give in to her again. Now look where she is. She turned to look at Cassie's photograph on the mantel. Then she was gone. You didn't like me when I was thin. You don't like me now I'm fat, do you? Cassie asks. I sit opposite Cassie's ghost on a chair I've dragged from the dining room. I haven't yet cleaned up the food mess from the floor. I stare into the myriad colors and textures. I've always loved you, Cassie. I worried about you when you were too thin. It didn't mean I disliked you. The saucepan flying through the air, the bolognese within it, spraying across the kitchen cabinets, plates smashed against the floor tiles in my desperation to see her eat. Never have I revealed this to Cassie, but these were the times I disliked her the most. I used to think you were a useless mother. Misery and wrath cross Cassie's face like a hologram changes when it is turned. Do you still think that? I ask. You didn't understand me. You were afraid to. Cassie's eyes meet mine. I see the depth of her melancholy, an infinite darkened pool. She is distant, forever out of reach, as she always was. Yet I fail to see it, fail to see why. A lump comes to my throat. I cannot swallow it down. I grab the dustpan and brush to clear away the debris from the floor. Next comes the mop, swishing back and forth until the dirty patch shines. Throughout, Cassie is silent, watching me work. Eventually she breaks the peace. Do you miss me? I lean on the mop handle. I miss you dreadfully, Cassie. I just wish our time together had been different, happier, less of a fight. Squeezing out the water from the mop, I wonder why Cassie's ghost did not return with the appearance she bore when she died. Emaciated, barely there. Was her ghostly bulk meant to taunt me? As if she reads my mind, she says, you were only happy when I ate, when I was bigger. So she comes here looking like this because she thinks it's how I prefer to see her. I drop my head to hide the brimming tears it doesn't make me happy to see you like this, to see you so sad. Not back then, and certainly not now. The tremble in my bones reverberates in my voice. Cassie judders, her mountainous bulk ripples. Her face crumples as the wailing kicks in. The mop drops from my hand, and I move to take her in my arms, stopping in my tracks when I realize I cannot touch her, cannot feel her. It's okay, sweetie. You don't have to do this. Believe me, I'd rather you rest. Her crying fades out like the end of a song. She becomes still. You don't wish to see me again? Her question is but a whisper. I would give anything to see you again. But not like this. And not if it causes you pain. For the first time since she started showing up here, I see her spirit smile. 5 a.m. The night after, and the dusky sky is littered with glistening dots. A chill seeps in through the open window. I shudder, get up to close the window, and with the click of its handle my sleepy brain registers that I have not been stirred to the sound of Cassie's dirge. I listen for her cries. Nothing except silence fills the house. I should climb into bed, 
thankful for the peace. Instead I creep downstairs, each step tentative, not wanting to rouse her or set off her wailing. The pantry door opens with a creak. I step inside. Cassie is gone, but for her heart charm, bracelet lying on the top of the refrigerator. I pick up the bracelet, place it around my wrist, feel her presence against my skin. It tells me she will not return here, that her haunting is done. I take the stairs, crawl into my bed. Instantly I fall asleep, Kazi's heart charm gripped between my fingertips. Bedtime is supposed to be a happy event for a tired child. For me it was terrifying, while some children might complain about being put to bed before they have finished watching a film or playing their favorite video game. When I was a child, nighttime was something to truly fear. Somewhere in the back of my mind, it still is. As someone who is trained in the sciences, I cannot prove that what happened to me was objectively real, but I can swear that what I experienced was genuine horror, a fear which in my life, I'm glad to say, has never been equaled. I will relate it to you all now as best I can. Make of it what you will, but I'll be glad to just get it off of my chest. I can't remember exactly when it started, but my apprehension towards falling asleep seemed to correspond with my being moved into a room of my own. I was eight years old at the time, and until then, I had shared a room, quite happily, with my older brother. As is perfectly understandable for a boy five years, my senior, my brother eventually wished for a room of his own, and as a result, I was given the room at the back of the house. It was a small, narrow, yet oddly elongated room, large enough for a bed and a couple of chests of drawers, but not much else. I couldn't really complain because, even at that age, I understood that we did not have a large house and I had no real cause to be disappointed, as my family was both loving and caring. It was a happy childhood during the day. A solitary window looked out onto our back garden. Nothing out of the ordinary, but even during the day, the light which crept into that room seemed almost hesitant. As my brother was given a new bed, I was given the bunk beds, which we used to share. While I was upset about sleeping on my own, I was excited at the thought of being able to sleep in the top bunk, which seemed far more adventurous to me. From the very first night, I remember a strange feeling of unease creeping slowly from the back of my mind. I lay on the top bunk, staring down at my action figures and cars strewn across the green-blue carpet. As imaginary battles and adventures took place between the toys on the floor, I couldn't help but feel that my eyes were being slowly drawn towards the bottom bunk, as if something was moving in the corner of my eye something which did not wish to be seen. The bunk was empty, impeccably made with a dark blue blanket, tucked in neatly, partially covering two rather bland white pillows. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was a child, and the noise slipping under my door from my parents' television bathed me in a warm sense of safety and well-being. I fell asleep. When you awaken from a deep sleep to something moving or stirring, it can take a few moments for you to truly understand what is happening. The fog of sleep hangs over your eyes and ears, even when lucid. Something was moving, there was no doubt about that. At first I wasn't sure what it was. Everything was dark, almost pitch black, but there was enough light creeping in from outside to outline that narrowly suffocating room, two thoughts appeared in my mind almost simultaneously. The first was that my parents were in bed because the rest of the house lay both in darkness and silence. The second thought turned to the noise, a noise which had obviously woken me. As the last cobwebs of sleep withered from my mind, the noise took on a more familiar form. 
Sometimes the simplest of sounds can be the most unnerving. A cold wind whistling through a tree outside, a neighbor's footsteps uncomfortably close, or, in this case, the simple sound of bedsheets rustling in the dark. That was it. Bedsheets rustling in the dark, as if some disturbed sleeper was attempting to get all too comfortable in the bottom bunk. I lay there in disbelief, thinking that the noise was either my imagination, or perhaps just my pet cat, finding somewhere comfortable to spend the night. It was then that I noticed my door, shut as it had been as I'd fallen asleep. Perhaps my mum had checked in on me, and the cat had sneaked into my room then. Yes, that must have been it. I turned to face the wall, closing my eyes in the vain hope that I could fall back to sleep. As I moved, the rustling noise from underneath me ceased. I thought that I must have disturbed my cat, but quickly I realized that the visitor in the bottom bunk was much less mundane than my pet trying to sleep, and much more sinister. As if alerted to, and disgruntled by, my presence, the disturbed sleeper began to toss and turn violently, like a child having a tantrum in their bed. I could hear the sheets twist and turn with increasing ferocity. Fear then gripped me, not like the subtle sense of unease I had experienced earlier, but now potent and terrifying. My heart raced as my eyes panicked, scanning the almost impenetrable darkness. I let out a cry. As most young boys do, I instinctively shouted on my mother. I could hear something stir on the other side of the house, but as I began to breathe a sigh of relief that my parents were coming to save me, the bunk bed suddenly started to shake violently, as if gripped by an earthquake, scraping against the wall. I could hear the sheets below me thrashing around, as if tormented by malice. I did not want to jump down to safety, as I feared the thing in the bottom bunk would reach out and grab me, pulling me into the darkness, so I stayed there, white knuckles clenching my own blanket like a shroud of protection. The wait seemed like an eternity. The door finally, and thankfully, burst open, and I lay bathed in light, while the bottom bunk, the resting place of my unwanted visitor, lay empty and peaceful. I cried, and my mother consoled me. Tears of fear, followed by relief, streamed down my face. Yet through all of the horror and relief, I did not tell her why I was so upset. I cannot explain it, but it was as though whatever had been in that bunk would return, if I even so much as spoke of it, or uttered a single syllable of its existence. Whether that was the truth, I do not know. But as a child, I felt as if that unseen menace remained close, listening. My mother lay in the empty bunk, promising to stay there until morning. Eventually my anxiety diminished. Tiredness pushed me back, towards sleep. But I remained restless, waking several times momentarily to the sound of rustling bedsheets. I remember the next day wanting to go anywhere, be anywhere, but in that narrow suffocating room. It was a Saturday and I played outside, quite happily with my friends. Although our house was not large, we were lucky to have a long sloping garden in the back. We played there often, as much of it was overgrown, and we could hide in the bushes, climb in the huge sycamore tree which towered above all else and easily imagine ourselves in the throes of a grand adventure, in some untamed, exotic land. As fun as it all was, occasionally my eye would turn to that small window, ordinary, slight, and innocuous. But for me, that thin boundary was a looking glass into a strange, cold pocket of dread. Outside, the lush green surroundings of our garden filled with the smiling face of my friends could not extinguish the creeping feeling clawing its way up my spine, each hair standing on end, the feeling of something in that room, watching me play, waiting for the night when I would be alone, eagerly filled with hate. It may sound strange to you, but by the time my parents ushered me back into that room, 
for the night, I said nothing. I didn't protest. I didn't even make an excuse as to why I couldn't sleep there. I simply and sullenly walked into that room, climbed the few steps into the top bunk and then waited. As an adult, I would be telling everyone about my experience, but even at that age, I felt almost silly to be talking about something which I really had no evidence for. I would be lying, however, if I said this was my primary reason. I still felt that this thing would be enraged if I so much as spoke of it. It's funny how certain words can remain hidden from your mind, no matter how blatant or obvious they are. One word came to me that second night, lying there in the darkness alone, frightened, aware of a rotten change in the atmosphere, a thickening of the air as if something had displaced it. As I heard the first casual twists of the bedsheets below, the first anxious increase of my heartbeat at the realization that something was once again in the bottom bunk, that word, a word which had been sent into exile, filtered up through my consciousness, breaking free of all repression, gasping for air, screaming, etching, and carving itself into my mind. Ghost. As this thought came to me, I noticed that my unwelcome visitor had ceased moving. The bedsheets lay calm and dormant, but they had been replaced by something far more hideous. A slow, rhythmic, rasping breath heaved and escaped from the thing below. I could imagine its chest rising and falling with each sordid, wheezing, and garbled breath. I shuddered and hoped beyond all hope that it would leave without occurrence. The house lay, as it had the previous night, in a thick blanket of darkness. Silence prevailed, all but for the perverted breath of my, as yet, unseen bunkmate. I lay there terrified. I just wanted this thing to go to leave me alone. What did it want? Then something unmistakably chilling transpired. It moved. It moved in a way different from before. When it threw itself around in the bottom bunk, it seemed unrestrained, without purpose, almost animalistic. This movement, however, was driven by awareness, with purpose, with a goal in mind. For that thing lying there in the darkness, that thing which seemed intent on terrorizing a young boy, calmly and nonchalantly sat up. Its labored breathing had become louder, as now only a mattress and a few flimsy wooden slats separated my body from the unearthly breath below. I lay there, my eyes filled with tears. A fear, which mere words cannot relate to you or anyone else coursed through my veins. I would not have believed that this fear could have been heightened, but I was so wrong. I imagined what this thing would look like, sitting there listing from below my mattress, hoping to catch the slightest hint that I was awake. Imagination then turned to an unnerving reality. It began to touch the wooden slats which my mattress sat on. It seemed to caress them carefully running what I imagined to be fingers and hands across the surface of the wood. Then with great force, it prodded angrily between two slats into the mattress. Even through the padding, it felt as though someone had viciously stuck their fingers into my side. I let out an almighty cry, and the wheezing, shaking, and moving thing in the bunk below replied in kind by violently vibrating the bunk as it had done the night before. Small flakes of paint powdered onto my blanket from the wall as the frame of the bed scraped along it, backwards and forwards. Once again I was bathed in light, and there stood my mother, loving, caring as she always was, with a comforting hug and calming words which eventually subdued my hysteria. Of course she asked what was wrong, but I could not say, I dared not say. I simply said one word, over and over and over again. Nightmare. This pattern of events continued for weeks, if not months. Night after night, I would awaken to the sound of rustling sheets, 
Each time I would scream so, as to not provide this abomination with time to prod and feel for me. With each cry the bed would shake violently, stopping with the arrival of my mother who would spend the rest of the night in the bottom bunk, seemingly unaware of the sinister force torturing her son nightly. Along the way I managed to feign illness a few times and come up with other less than truthful reasons for sleeping in my parents' bed. But more often than not, I would be alone for the first few hours of each night in that place. The room where the light from outside did not sit right, alone with that thing. With time you can become desensitized to almost anything, no matter how horrific. I had come to realize that for whatever reason, this thing could not harm me when my mother was present. I am sure the same would have been said for my father, but as loving as he was, waking him from sleep was almost impossible. After a few months I had grown accustomed to my nightly visitor. Do not mistake this for some unearthly friendship. I detested the thing. I still feared it greatly, as I could almost sense its desires and its personality, if you could call it that. One filled with a perverted and twisted hatred, yet longing for me, of perhaps all things. My greatest fears were realized in the winter. The days grew short, and the longer nights merely provided this wretch with more opportunities. It was a difficult time for my family. My grandmother, a wonderfully kind and gentle woman, had deteriorated greatly since the death of my grandfather. My mother was trying her best to keep her in the community as long as possible. However, dementia is a cruel and degenerative illness, robbing a person of their memories one day at a time. Soon she recognized none of us, and it became clear that she would need to be moved from her house to a nursing home. Before she could be moved, my grandmother had a particularly difficult few nights, and my mother decided that she would stay with her. As much as I loved my grandmother, and felt nothing but anguish at her illness, to this day I feel guilty that my first thoughts were not of her, but of what my nightly visitor may do should it become aware of my mother's absence. Her presence being the one thing which I was sure was protecting me from the full horror of this thing's reach. I rushed home from school that day and immediately wrenched the bed sheets and mattress from the lower bunk, removing all of the slats and placing an old desk, a chest of drawers and some chairs which we kept in a cupboard where the bottom bunk used to be. I told my father I was making an office which he found adorable, but I would be damned if I'd give that thing a place to sleep for one more night. As darkness approached, I lay there knowing my mother was not in the house. I did not know what to do. My only impulse was to sneak into her jewelry box and take a small family crucifix, which I had seen there before. While my family were not very religious, at that age I still believed in God and hoped that somehow this would protect me. Although fearful and anxious, while gripping the crucifix under my pillow, tightly in one hand. Sleep eventually came, and as I drifted off to dream, I hoped that I would awaken in the morning without incidents. Unfortunately, that night was the most terrifying of all. I woke gradually. The room was once again dark. As my eyes adjusted, I could gradually make out the window, and the door, and the walls, some toys on a shelf, and... Even to this day I shudder to think of it, for there was no noise, no rustling of sheets, no movement at all. The room felt lifeless, lifeless yet not empty. The nightly visitor, that unwelcome, wheezing, hate-filled thing, which had terrorized me night after night, was not in the bottom bunk, it was in my bed. I opened my mouth to scream, but nothing came out. Utter terror had shaken the very sound from my voice. I lay motionless. If I could not scream, I did not want to let it know I was awake. I had not yet seen it. I could only feel it. 
It was obscured under my blanket. I could see its outline, and I could feel its presence, but I dared not look. The weight of it pressed down on top of me, a sensation I will never forget. When I say that hours passed, I do not exaggerate, laying there motionless in the darkness. I was every bit a scared and frightened young boy. If it had been during the summer months, it would have been light by then, but the grasp of winter is long and unrelenting, and I knew it would be hours before sunrise, a sunrise which I yearned for. I was a timid child by nature, but I reached a breaking point, a moment where I could wait no more, where I could survive under this intimately deviant abomination no longer. Fear can sometimes wear you out, make you threadbare, a shell of nerves leaving only the slightest trace of you behind. I had to get out of that bed, then I remembered the crucifix. My hand still lay underneath the pillow, but it was empty. I slowly moved my wrist around to find it, minimizing as best I could the sound and vibrations caused, but it could not be found. I had either knocked it off of the top bunk, or it had, uh, I could not even bear to think of it, been taken from my hand. Without the crucifix I lost any sense of hope. Even at such a young age, you can be acutely aware of what death is, and intensely frightened of it. I knew I was going to die in that bed if I lay there, dormant, passive, doing nothing. I had to leave that room behind. But how? Should I leap from the bed and hope that I make it to the door? What if it is faster than me? Or should I slowly slip out of that top bunk, hoping to not disturb my uncanny bedfellow? Realizing that it had not stirred when I moved, trying to find the crucifix, I began to have the strangest of thoughts. What if it was asleep? It hadn't so much as breathed since I had woken up. Perhaps it was resting, believing that it had finally got me that I was finally in its grasp, or perhaps it was toying with me, after all. It had been doing just that for countless nights, and now with me under it, pinned against my mattress with no mother to protect me. Maybe it was holding off, savoring its victory until the last possible moment, like a wild animal savoring its prey. I tried to breathe as shallowly as possible, and mustering every ounce of courage I could, I reached over slowly with my right hand and began to peel the blanket off of me. What I found under those covers almost stopped my heart. I did not see it, but as my hand moved the blanket, it brushed against something, something smooth and cold, something which felt unmistakably like a gaunt hand. I held my breath in terror as I was sure it must now have known that I was awake. Nothing. It did not stir, it felt dead. After a few moments, I placed my hand carefully further down the blanket and felt a thin, poorly formed forearm. My confidence and almost twisted sense of curiosity grew. As I moved down further to a disproportionately larger bicep muscle, the arm was outstretched, lying across my chest, with the hand resting on my left shoulder as if it had grabbed me in my sleep. I realized that I would have to move this cadaverous appendage if I even so much as hoped to escape its grasp. For some reason, the feeling of torn, ragged clothing on the shoulder of this nighttime invader stopped me in my tracks. Fear once again swelled in my stomach and in my chest as I recoiled my hand in disgust at the touch of straggled oily hair. I could not bring myself to touch its face, although I wonder to this very day what it would have felt like. Dear God, it moved. It was subtle, but its grip on my shoulder and across my body strengthened. No tears came, but God, how I wanted to cry, as its hand and arm slowly coiled around me. My right leg brushed along the cool wall which the bed lay against. Of all that happened to me in that room, this was the strangest. I realized that this clutching, rancid thing 
which drew great delight from violating a young boy's bed, was not entirely on top of me. It was sticking out from the wall, like a spider striking from its lair. Suddenly its grip moved, from a slow tightening to a sudden squeeze. It pulled and clawed at my clothes, as if frightened that the opportunity would soon pass. I fought against it, but its emaciated arm was too strong for me. Its head rose up, writhing and contorting under the blanket. I now realized where it was taking me, into the wall. I fought for my dear life, I cried, and suddenly my voice returned to me, yelling, screaming, but no one came. Then I realized why it was so eager to suddenly strike, why this thing had to have me now. Through my window, that window which seemed to represent so much malice from outside, streaked hope, the first rays of sunshine. I struggled further, knowing that if I could just hold on, it would soon be gone. As I fought for my life, the unearthly parasite shifted, slowly pulling itself up my chest its head now poking out from under the blanket, wheezing, coughing, rasping. I do not remember its features. I simply remember its breath against my face, foul and as cold as ice. As the sun broke over the horizon, that dark place, that suffocating room of contempt, was washed, bathed in sunlight. I passed out as its scrawny fingers encircled my neck, squeezing the very life from me. I awoke to my father offering to make me some breakfast. A wonderful sight indeed. I had survived the most horrible experience of my life until then, and now. I moved the bed away from the wall, leaving behind the furniture I had believed would stop that thing from taking a bed. Little did I think that it would try to take mine and me. Weeks passed without incidents, Yet on one cold, frost-bitten night, I woke to the sound of the furniture where the bunk beds used to be, vibrating violently. In a moment it passed. I lay there, sure I could hear a distant wheezing coming from deep within the wall, finally fading into the distance. I have never told anyone this story before. To this day I still break out in a cold sweat at the sound of bedsheets rustling in the night or a wheeze brought on by a common cold, and I certainly never sleep with my bed against a wall. Call it superstition if you will, but as I said, I cannot discount conventional explanations, such as sleep paralysis, hallucination, or that of an overactive imagination. But what I can say is this. The following year I was given a larger room on the other side of the house, and my parents took that strangely suffocating elongated place as their bedroom. They said they didn't need a large room, just one big enough for a bed and a few things. They lasted 10 days. We moved on the 11th. 